Welcome to Playground Books, essays revisiting the stories I first read as a kid and loved enough to spend my recesses reading. Like almost any book lover who made it through piles of summer reading only to be hit with those lists of 101 classics that you have to read before you die, I have complicated feelings about that specific kind of literary categorization, and most other kinds, but that's not relevant at the moment. I do have a deep and illogically personal love for a few of the classics. There is not a way to explain how I feel about Camus' The Stranger, for instance. And yet, others fall prey to the circumstances of being assigned reading books for sixth graders ready to pile onto the bandwagon of defining themselves in opposition, primed by distrust of being told ahead of time what is supposed to be good or important or lasting. It is a difficult thing to force love. Love of books is no exception. That was my experience, reading A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langle for the first time. It was a strange book, a book that we, the royal we, were being forced into without choice, and the royal we had unilaterally come to the decision that these two things disqualified it. Years of students before us had read it, and we will have to read it, and it is bizarre, and that is how we shall feel. This is ludicrously unfair, but we were kids. A Wrinkle in Time is a gorgeous read, and it is such a quintessential children's classic that I am a little embarrassed I didn't let it beat through my young cynicism. For those who were not forced to read it in English classes, or who, like me, have let its memory slip, its point-of-view character is a young girl, an outcast named Meg Murray, whose scientist father mysteriously vanished four years prior. Meg is deeply unliked. Flyaway hair, mouth chock full of braces, thick glasses. She doesn't have many friends or do well in school, the strange, dumb child of two brilliant physicists. Meg is different, but in the ordinary way, blunt and stubborn and angry. One of the first things she does in the book is pick a fight with a group of bullies making jokes about her, quote, dumb baby brother. The baby brother in question is Charles Wallace, and quite far from dumb. In fact, despite being five years old, he is very nearly the most mature main character in the novel, or at least the most intelligent. This makes for a lot of fun when he speaks with an elevated vocabulary and perceptive analysis of the world around him, and then says things like, I really must learn how to read, except I'm afraid it will make it awfully hard for me in school next year if I already know things. Charles Wallace's strangeness goes further, though, as he is a little bit telepathic and nearly clairvoyant. He is drawn to a house on the property neighboring theirs, where one by one they meet Mrs. Whatsit, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch, three ladies who are not ladies, and not even human, and do a delightfully poor job of dressing themselves up in humanity. That's literal in the case of Mrs. Whatsit who wears piles of layered scarves, bundled over a formless overcoat, and clonking rubber boots. She relishes in her overt quirkiness, the youngest of the three by, as she says, a paltry few billion years. Next we have Mrs. Who, who has difficulty fitting her meanings to our languages, and speaks mostly in translated quotations. Yet even she is more understandable than Mrs. Witch, who materializes as a felt presence and a shadow more than anything physical, the most ancient of all of them. Rounding out the cast, we have Calvin, a boy who Meg has seen in school. He's a couple years older, well-liked and on the basketball team, and yet he finds himself drawn to the Mrs. W's the same way as Charles Wallace. The two of them are alike in their strangeness, feeling that something is lying undiscovered that only they are able to understand, but they're just grasping at the edges. The result is that they don't feel fit to the ordinary world around them. Calvin comes from a large family, but they don't seem to care much about him or even notice when he's gone, and when he's invited to the Murray's house mere hours after meeting them, he says he feels like he's going home for the first time in his life. Now that we've got the characters assembled, we can get the journey underway. To rescue Charles Wallace and Meg's father, and to fight against a greater darkness. Also, we can now get to the idea behind the title of the book. Mrs. Whatsit, Who, and Which whisk the children off through space and time to another planet, traveling through manipulation of the fifth dimension, which they call tessering. 
Simply put, the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line, if you consider the possibility of going beyond three dimensions. The book includes little illustrations to explain everything here, which I do recommend looking up. It's another example of a children's book doing an excellent job melding the fringes of theoretical science into fantasy in a believable way. To give a subpar audio explanation, one dimension is a line, two makes a square, three a cube, four adds time into the mix, and five dimensions makes a tesseract, hence tessering. If you take a piece of fabric, for example, and want to get from one end to the other, it's much faster to do that if it's wrinkled up together. Similarly, the Mrs. W's wrinkle time and space in their travel, launching the children away from the safety of their home to far-flung alien worlds. Aside from the metaphysics, there's two things to call attention in the story thus far. The first is Meg. When she and Charles Wallace stumble across Calvin, the two boys size each other up and eventually determine that they are of a kind, both of them called to the adventure of the Mrs. W's. They instinctively know that they're meant to be companions in the undertaking of rescuing Mr. Murray. This is because of their different, more perceptive way of thinking which allows them to understand the fantastical physics of tesseracts and also to withstand the mind-based assaults to come later. But Meg is not like them, and Charles Wallace tells Calvin that she has it tough because, quote, she's not really one thing or the other. From a writing perspective, part of this is practical. As our point of view character, Meg needs things explained to her that we also need explained to us. But it also ties in to the second point to note here that Calvin exemplifies, which is this feeling like they're not really meant to be in the position that they're in. So much of the draw of this book is the promise of the imagined, of a world not quite like our own. Like Calvin, we're thrilled by the feeling that things are about to happen, that the adventure we're meant for is about to begin. A Wrinkle in Time asks through its main characters, what it is like to be not of this world, to be an outcast and a misfit. A lot of stories take that idea and turn it into an opportunity to create a lovable band of misfits all thrown together, so that none really are misfits or cast out at all. Instead, A Wrinkle in Time not only keeps its narrator as an outsider within the group of outsiders, remember, we're reminded that Meg is not really one thing or the other, but also it uses their unfitness as the door and reason for embarking upon important danger. And I do mean danger. As the children travel across the universe, it becomes clear that this is not a light-hearted trip, even with as much beauty and wonder as they encounter when the W's take them to far-ranging planets brimming with vibrant and outlandish life. At one, they witness the far edge of the atmosphere, where a dark shadow blots out the stars. They know without being told that it is deeply evil, and it is what their father is fighting. They come to understand that Earth is what's called a dark planet, shrouded in the sway of evil, that must constantly be fought against and overcome in smallest ways. There's a distinction, I believe, between ideas and inventions in stories. Not to say that it's an either-or proposition, but often one or the other is the selling point of a book. Novels categorized as realism, set in the ordinary world with ordinary characters, can spend their time building up complicated theses and convoluted arguments with nuance and no clear answers. And then so many fantasy books, with their fully realized worlds packed with astounding inventions, tend to come down in their ideas to good versus evil, light versus dark. The ideas here, of the dark thing and the troubles of Earth to be struggled against, are fairly simplistic, but the inventions used to portray them are what's beautiful and elaborate, which I think in some way excuses the straightforwardness. Also, it seems that Lengel's not afraid of tropes in the service of making a point. One biographer called A Wrinkle in Time her most audaciously original work of fiction, and yet she did borrow the cliché line, it was a dark and stormy night, to begin it. 
in the scene where the children are seeing the black thing for the first time, one little detail stuck out. As they're flown up to the edge of the atmosphere, on the back of a metamorphosed Mrs. What's-It, which I'm skipping over some stuff there, sorry about that, Charles Wallace says that he wants instead to turn around to watch the moon set. But Mrs. What's-It says, No child, do not turn around, any of you. Face out toward the dark. This is not a story about what you want. It's dangerous and often ideological, and the children are just children who want to take in the sights of a universe far larger than they knew. But it's not sightseeing, it's not a fun adventure, and they must witness the dark in order to understand that. Most of the second half of the book takes place on a planet called Camazots. Camazots is where Mr. Murray is being held, a planet completely overtaken by the Black Thing. It is controlled, unhelpfully for my audio retelling, by an entity referred to only as It. Mrs. What's-It, Who, and Which transport the children to Camazots, but they are unable to stay there, and they impart gifts and warnings before Meg, Calvin, and Charles Wallace must go on alone into the town where it resides. Walking into the outskirts, the children feel that there is something wrong there, something off. The inhabitants look human, and the streets look like any American suburb, but most noticeable is the preternatural sameness. In the yards of each of the identical houses, children move in synchronized play. When Charles Wallace points this out, the following description is given. This was so. As the skipping rope hit the pavement, so did the ball. As the rope curved over the head of the jumping child, the child with the ball caught the ball. Down came the ropes, down came the balls, over and over again. Up, down, all in rhythm, all identical. Like the houses, like the paths, like the flowers. Then the doors of all the houses opened simultaneously, and out came women like a row of paper dolls. The print of their dresses was different, but they all gave the appearance of being the same. Each woman stood on the steps of her house. Each clapped. Each child with the ball caught the ball. Each child with the skipping rope folded the rope. Each child turned and walked into the house. The doors clicked shut behind them. When they see one boy playing out of sync, his mother pulls him inside, terrified, promising that they haven't had an aberration in their neighborhood in years. Further into the capital city of Camazots, at Central, Central Intelligence, they find much the same. People following rules and procedures to exacting sameness, frightened of being called out for causing a scruple in the pattern. They enter the main capital building and find a man with red eyes acting as a mouthpiece for it, who engages the children, and primarily Charles Wallace, in a test of telepathic wits. Let's pause for a moment here and talk about Marxist literary theory. This is a way of examining a work of art, in this case a book, as an ideological conception of the world, either perpetuating, subverting, or some combination thereof, the dominant society within which it was created. Literary critic Terry Eagleton, in his book Marxism and Literature, says that the aim of Marxist literary theory, quote, is to explain the literary work more fully, and this means a sensitive attention to its forms, styles, and meanings, but it also means grasping those forms, styles, and meanings as the products of a particular history. A Wrinkle in Time was published in 1962 in the midst of the Cold War, and it is obvious to see the oppressive uniformity of Camazots as a reflection of the fear of communism. The boy whom the children see playing out of turn is later taken away for reprogramming. No individuality or uniqueness is allowed, and indeed is punished by it, who keeps the inhabitants of Camazots under its total control. Technically provided for, but deeply unhappy. Even more so, we've seen this earlier with Meg, who despite being skilled in the tricks and shortcuts of mathematics that her father taught her, 
struggles and is unvalued in the formal regulations of the school system. As the children face it, they fight to avoid its mind-controlling power, desperate to retain their individuality, even the individuality and differences that Meg bemoaned earlier in the book for how they made her stick out. The larger conflict of the book between good and evil is played out through the language of individualist and communist ideologies, using the images and worries of the time period when it was written. The analysis is a little obvious, but it's an example of this approach to understanding not only the text of the book, but the context, and the potential biases and viewpoints it contains. Allow me one more quote from Eagleton on specifically the value of analyzing literature from this ideological perspective beyond just a cultural or a biographical one. Ideology signifies the imaginary ways in which men experience the real world, which is, of course, the kind of experience literature gives us too. What it feels like to live in particular conditions, rather than a conceptual analysis of those conditions. In this, he's saying that literature can be a powerful tool for analysis in reverse as well. It reveals more about the ideology of a time than even a strict history of that time, because it contains this step of abstraction, of imagination, to depict how a way of living is experienced and felt about beyond just the literal or logical facts of how it is. Back to the story. It's right about time for everything to go wrong, and for the flaws and fall of Charles Wallace. Charles Wallace is a risky character. The risk is that as a child who's mature and perceptive beyond his years, the smartest person in nearly any room, and also astoundingly kind and unselfish, he can be at best unbelievable and at worst utterly and annoyingly boring, able to solve any problem put to him. This is probably also why he's not the actual lead character a role which falls instead to the much more human Meg. But on Camazot's, his fatal flaws surface, that he's arrogant and, despite his mental acuity, short-sighted. The Mrs. W's warn him of this, but even so, when the children come to a standstill with it, he willingly allows himself to be controlled by its hypnosis, hoping to uncover the location of their father and falsely believing that he will be able to merely will himself back out. The hypnotized Charles Wallace does lead Meg and Calvin to Mr. Murray, and with the help of one of the gifts from Mrs. Who, Meg is able to free him from his prison. But then the story takes a further turn inward that I love here. Meg's objective for the entirety of the book thus far has been to find and free her father. It's very simple. And then she does so. However, succeeding does not bring her the joy or the help that she wished. Her father is just another man, and he doesn't know what to do. He was just barely able to withstand it as long as he did, and he doesn't know either how they're supposed to help Charles Wallace or what they're supposed to do next. Here's a quote from when they're approaching it itself. She stepped forward tentatively. She felt that she was beyond fear now. Charles Wallace was no longer Charles Wallace. Her father had been found, but he had not made everything all right. Instead, everything was worse than ever, and her adored father was bearded and thin and white and not omnipotent after all. No matter what happened next, things could be no more terrible or frightening than they already were. Oh, couldn't they? It is revealed to be a giant disembodied brain, terrifying and disgusting to Meg. She, Calvin, and her father fight against it in an attempt to keep their minds free of its hypnotizing power, shouting nursery rhymes and the Declaration of Independence. Remember the idea of literature as a reflection of ideology. But they're not strong enough, and in a last-ditch effort, Mr. Murray tessers himself, Calvin, and Meg away from Camazots, leaving Charles Wallace behind. It takes Meg some time, and the care of a giant, faceless, plant-like alien she comes to call Aunt Beast, to recover from her father's amateur tesser, 
and when she does, she is furious at him for abandoning Charles Wallace. Again, they have no idea what to do, until Mrs. What's It Who and Witch return. But the Mrs. W's are troubled by their half-measure of success, and they're less comforting than before, which is a striking turn to emphasize these darkest hours of the plot. They instruct that the only way to save Charles Wallace is for Meg to return to Camisots, this time alone. Calvin and Mr. Murray strenuously object, arguing against Mrs. Whatsit, trying to take Meg's place, until Mrs. Whatsit says one of my favorite lines in the book, You are going to allow Meg the privilege of accepting this danger. There is wild importance and responsibility in the privilege of accepting danger. I think it's something all children should be allowed. So this whole story, the grand cosmic battle, comes down not to the brilliant boy genius or the popular yet kind sports star or the capable and presumed omnipotent adults. It comes down to an outcast of a girl. Not very clever, not very pretty, not special or exceptional, not one thing or the other but a girl who is blunt and stubborn and impatient and flawed and angry. There is nothing quite like the righteous anger of a terrified girl who knows there's no one else coming to save her. Mrs. Witch transports Meg back to Camisots and tells her that she will succeed because of what she has that it lacks. The answer to this ambiguous prompt Meg discovers is love, which, yes, means that Charles Wallace is pulled from his trance and the day is saved and the book ended with the power of love. I did warn about the difference between complicated ideas and complicated inventions. That is the stated ending and conclusion, but I think there's more to be read in it than that. Meg's love is not gentle but fierce, and it's not vague general love of the world or, thank goodness, romantic love, but instead weaponized love for her baby brother, who made a mistake and needs, literally, to be saved from himself. It's much more about defiant love, love in the face of others who have told you that it is not worth it and you are not worth it. When Meg is walking through Camisots on her way to confront it and trying to understand the Mrs. W's hints, she says, I don't understand what she said, but I think it was meant to make me not hate being only me, and me being the way I am. And this self-love, not only that, but refusal of self-hate, is the same kind of weaponized love that saves the day. Meg, who is introduced as unliked and bullied and not good for much, who spends so much of this book hating herself in both passive and direct ways, hating the things about herself that make her the way she is, and hating that she is only those things, must turn against that thinking and say that her love vanquishes. And it does. My copy of A Wrinkle in Time begins with a foreword by Anna Quinlan titled An Appreciation, which discusses at the start why we pay attention to books like this one. It tells, The most memorable books from our childhoods are the ones that make us feel less alone, convince us that our own foibles and quirks are both as individual as a fingerprint and as universal as an open hand. That's why I still have the copy of A Wrinkle in Time that was given to me when I was 12 years old. It long ago lost its dust jacket, the fabric binding is loose and water-stained, and the soft and loopy signature on its inside cover bears little resemblance to the way I signed my name today. The girl who first owned it has grown up and changed, but the book she loved, though battered, is still magical. I'd have to agree. And as I said at the start, there are other classics and children's books closer to my heart, but A Wrinkle in Time well earns its reputation. I'll finish with a recommendation. If you've read A Wrinkle in Time or this discussion was interesting to you, I'd recommend Out of the Silent Planet by C.S. Lewis. On that topic of ideas versus inventions in books, this one has both as it does seem to be C.S. Lewis's hallmark to begin fantasy or science fiction stories, 
and then get utterly sidetracked with the allegories and philosophical debates he can nest within them. In it, a man is kidnapped and taken to Mars, called Malacandra, where he meets and learns the culture of several intelligent species, and then plays a role in the trial of humanity and what drives it to exist and expand and explore. It has both the beautiful world-building and descriptions of A Wrinkle in Time, and also interrogate some of the questions that it merely glances across. Thanks for listening. The music is by David Hillowitz, the book is by Madeline Langell, the opinions are by me. For the next episode, I'll be rereading The Right Three by Blue Balliette. Talk to you then. Thank you.